Chair, Captain DePete, in your testimony, you mentioned the difference in safety rest standards, flight time duty between passenger airline and cargo airline operations. Yes, sir. The so-called cargo carve-out. Right. Can you explain to me how this came to be and why this is a problem? And what do you believe should be done about this imbalance? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, near and dear to my heart, of course. Uh, and I know we have somebody in the audience here was also on the, on the ARC, on the uh, flight time duty time ARC, so I'll try to get this right. But uh, when, uh, obviously after the Colgan accident, when it was determined that fatigue played a part in the accident, uh, they come out, through an ARC process, we came out with industry and regulators worked together with, uh, with labor to come up with uh, FAR 117. I think it's a pretty good rule. And due to a cost-benefit analysis that was done, uh, it was determined, and I say a specious uh, argument at best, because I looked at the, what examples they cited to make the determination. They eliminated uh, cargo out of the rule based on an uh, ineffective cost-benefit analysis. I think the cost was supposed to be upwards of $500 million, and it was only a $31 million benefit. Now, I would say that that's a dangerous way to go in a sense that you could weigh uh, and maybe weight the idea of what the cost is or the benefit is. First of all, I, like I said, I think it was flawed. They weren't measuring a 777 loaded with dangerous goods barreling down into Los Angeles. They picked a 727, an old aircraft, that fell short of a runway in Florida somewhere in Tallahassee in a remote area. So um, flawed cost-benefit analysis, but all the same, I think we should maybe look, or you could look, the, the committee could look at as to whether or not so when we're dealing with safety issues, do we want that to be the number one weighted factor or do we want it just somewhere in the list? Um, second of all, here's, here's the real situation. Imagine this for a moment, and I use this example a lot. Um, you have a school bus in one lane on a highway and it's, it's proven, uh, and you got your children on that school bus, okay? You've got your children going to school on that school bus and right next to it is a tractor trailer carrying a bunch of freight on it. Um, it's a proven fact scientifically that time awake of 17 hours or more on task is equal to a blood alcohol level of about 0 0.05. So you have a very sober driver driving your kids to school and right next to them is a tractor trailer. My point in bringing that up was impaired, obviously impaired. My point in bringing it up is we share the same skies, we fly over the same cities, we land at the same airports. Um, I remember that even the, if you know, uh, traffic collision avoidance system. It was included in passenger airplanes and not in, in cargo aircraft. And it took an almost head-on collision with Air Force One to make that change. So it, it's so, it's a gaping, if I had to describe it as anything, you're only as strong as your weakest link. We have a great safety system, um, but that's one loop, that's one gap that needs to be closed and here's I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this because it's an important statistic. When you look at the two individual risk factors of both passenger ops and cargo ops, and you look at the frequency with which passengers fly and cargo got, fly, with it kind of tallied if you looked at the number of departures, and we swapped and we did as much flying as passengers did, we'd have in a million, in a million departures 10 years, you'd have 276 accidents in that 10 year period. That's the difference in that risk profile. It's startling. So we really need to close that gap because all your strong is the weakest link. Thank you. Thank you. I'll yield the remaining of my time to Representative Napolitano as she has to go vote for another committee. Thank you.